Hey, greetings once again. Praise the Lord. This is Clinton. To those of you who are in Christ Jesus, you know me as Brother Clinton. And it is the sixth day of the week, the eighth day of May, the year of our Lord, 2015, 5775. And I'd like to continue, by the grace of God, with you this day in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ our Lord. We left off at the end of the 20th chapter, and I want to pick up in the beginning of the 21st chapter. May God bless the reading of his word, and let's just dive right into it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Blessed be the name of the Lord. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Well, this is nothing new for those of us who know the scripture. We know that Isaiah saw this. And let's go back to, I hold your place in the Revelation. Let's go back to Isaiah in the 65th chapter. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 17. God says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And Peter wrote about this. We're going to look at 2 Peter, in the second chapter. Yeah, excuse me, in the third chapter, starting with verse 10. Peter says, by the word of the Lord, and I'm in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Okay, so this heaven that we look at right now and this earth that we live on right now is not going to be here forever, at least not in the form that it is right now. It's going to be destroyed, and Jesus Christ will make new heavens and a new earth, and this will happen at the time of the end of the Lord's day. The Lord's day is of course is of course that seventh day, that seventh period of one thousand years, when Jesus Christ will sit and reign in his throne in Jerusalem over all the nations of the world. This is why God gave Israel the Sabbath day. This is why he created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day. And he sanctified the seventh day and gave it to Israel as a Sabbath day. And this is why we who are in this new covenant, we enter into his rest by being filled with his spirit because that the, the sabbath day under the law was a type or a shadow that represented his rest okay and the sabbath days are not passed away the people of israel will keep them again in the future when uh, israel is established in her land in the future in the, in, the, in the day of the lord but right now the church of jesus christ does not have any commandment to observe sabbath days as after the manner of moses even as we do not observe circumcision or animal sacrifices after the manner of moses all those things were a type or a shadow of good things to come. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we which have believed do enter into rest. And in the 28th chapter of Isaiah, we can see that the rest and the refreshing is when we come into Jesus Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues. As the scripture prophesied that that would happen. So there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And it will be at the time of the end of the Lord's day. The Lord Jesus Christ will sit and reign on his throne for a thousand years. We just read about that in the 20th chapter of the Revelation. And then at the end of that time, Satan will be loosed out of his prison to go and deceive the nations in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog, okay, which I believe are... A Gog is a, is a principality of, of wickedness, a satanic principality. And Magog is a, is a word that means the nations of God, or the multitudes of God, the nations of God, more properly. So Gog is the principality of wickedness, and Magog is the nations that he has rule and control over. And they will go out to deceive the four quarters of the world, and God will destroy them with his judgment to protect his people. And then at the end of that time, the day of the Lord, there will come this. God will destroy the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth shall the heavens will be destroyed with a great noise, and the earth shall be burned up in the works that are therein, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So John says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then I'm going to go kind of back over them and explain some things to you, because it's very important that we, in the Church of Jesus Christ, understand these things. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Who is this bride? Who is this city? Hallelujah. That is, that is uh, as prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Well, let me read you a couple of passages from the scripture. Help me out on this, Father, please, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Ephesians, if we go to the letter to the Ephesians, in the second chapter. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His word is so perfect. Hallelujah. In the second chapter, and we're going to start in verse 19. Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and following. Paul says by the Holy Ghost, Now therefore ye are, excuse me, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. And of course this letter is written to the church. Okay, if you have any questions about that, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 1. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who this letter is addressed to. So that's <clears throat> who he was talking to. Now, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. Okay, what's a household? Well, that's your house and the things that happen in that house. Your wife, your children the events of your household, the order of your household, the things that come to pass in your household, the things that need to be planned in your household, the things that are eaten and prepared in your household, everything that I've just mentioned is part of your household. And the house is the building, and the household is the life that is carried out in the building and the people that belong to it. Okay, And of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom also, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Wow, that kind of sounds like you and me in Christ Jesus are kind of like bricks that are part of an actual spiritual house, a temple, that is being built for God. And we are not only in that house, we, as different parts, make up that house. You think I could rightly say that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because let's go over to First Peter in the second chapter and look at and, and see how Peter said the same thing. Let's start in verse five. Second, or excuse me, First Peter chapter two, verse five. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. Wait a second. You and me, ye, okay, this is who this letter is addressed to, the church of Jesus Christ. We are as lively stones, living stones, stones that exist and move and breathe. And we have our being through Jesus Christ. We also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Hallelujah. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. If we look, and I'm not going to go there right now, you can, you can search this out for yourself, but if we look through the Old Testament scriptures and we see how the, tem the tabernacle of the Lord was built and how the temple of Solomon was built and how the temple that Herod built was built, and, and if we look at the temple that Ezekiel spoke about in, in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, which will be built in the future and will exist on the earth during the time of the day of the Lord, when Jesus Christ will sit on his throne and reign in Jerusalem. If we look at that temple we can see that it is built with rooms inside the walls. First, second, and third levels. The one that was built on the earth. First, second, and third levels. And inside those rooms, they were designed for the priests and the singers to sing praises unto the Lord. And so the priests and the singers would fill the walls. They would stand in their rooms, first, second, and third stories, inside the walls, 
so that they would all be facing the center where the Ark of the Covenant was behind the veil, and that is where they would sing and praise the Lord. That is because that temple, that tabernacle, was built according to the pattern that was showed to Moses in the mount. I think it's Hebrews 8, 5 that says that God said to Moses, Beware that ye do all things according to the pattern that was showed to thee on the mount. That temple, that tabernacle, was built in a specific way for a specific reason to signify the exact design of the one that exists in heaven. And that one that exists in heaven, the walls of it are built of the people of the living God. You see, the bride of Jesus Christ isn't someone who's going to inhabit the house of God. The bride of Jesus Christ is the house of God. And this is why in the third chapter of Hebrews, and let's go there right now. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 3. Hallelujah. I'm going to start in verse 2, talking about Christ Jesus. It says, Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? See, so Moses was faithful in his house as a steward, as a servant, but Christ as a son over his own house, because he that built and maketh all things is God. See, it's written in the scripture, I think in Second Samuel chapter 7, wherever it was that God spoke to David, his servant David, and David, God said to David, I'm going to build you a house, okay, and I'm going to cause your son to come forth from your loins, and he's going to build me a house, and it's going to be forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Christ is a son over his own house. He's not a steward in a house built by someone else. He is the Lord of the house. He is the one who has built the house, and that house is us. We are that house. Listen again, Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ has a son over his own house. Whose house are we? We're not in the house. We are the house. Whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Those folks out there who believe that Calvinists once saved, always saved doctrine are lost and they don't know how to be saved. If they knew how to be saved, they would know that there's no such thing as once saved, always saved. And I'm just going to leave that at that. But the scripture says many times what it says right here. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And this is why Paul said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is what we as Christians do unto the end. We confess Jesus Christ with our mouth so that other people can hear. Because how shall they hear without a preacher? And we continue in the faith of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we, if we do not continue in the faith of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, then there will be no resurrection for us. It just stands to reason. If you stop believing in the resurrection, then you will not receive a resurrection. In order to be raised from the dead in Christ Jesus when you pass from this body, you must continue to the end to believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is all about. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But I digress from there. I'm in Revelation again, chapter 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Who is she? She is the church. She is the church. She is not a building that the church dwells in. The building is the church. The church is the temple. Jesus Christ said, Ye are the temple of the living God, through his servant Paul. Ye are the temple of the living God. I and Verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. See, like Jesus said, I in them, and thou in me, that they may know that thou hast sent me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This that we're reading about is the time when the people of God will no longer be in a separate place from God and able to come into his presence to pray 
when we make ourselves clean by his blood and by keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, but it will be that there will be no more sinfulness and we will be made perfect before him and he will be in the midst of his people. Okay, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, they, they had God dwelling near them, among them. Okay, The tabernacle was pitched afar off, outside the camp. And God dwelt with them. No, not with them. Excuse me. In their, among them. Okay? Among them. Not in the midst of them, but among them. And now when, that the New Testament has come, God dwells in his people. God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. But the time is coming when God will dwell with his people, and there will be no more sins to be forgiven. There will be no more transgressions. There will be no more sinners. Sinners will be destroyed out of it. And the only ones that remain will be those that are holy. And this is why Jesus Christ said in, in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Verily I say unto you, there be many that stand here which shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. May the Lord minister those words to you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sinners shall be destroyed out of the kingdom. At the end of the Lord's Day, <clears throat> at the end of that period of 1,000 years called the Lord's Day, Jesus said that the angels would be sent forth to gather out the tares and burn them in the fire. Okay? At the end of that time called the Lord's Day, the angels of the Lord will be sent among his kingdom to gather out those that are sinners and those that are transgressors among them. And the only ones that are left will be the saints. And the heavens shall be destroyed with a great noise, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And God will make a new heaven and a new earth. And before he makes that new heaven and a new earth, he's going to make sure that the things that have happened in this earth because of sin don't happen again in that heaven and that earth. <coughs> Pardon me. So sin from its root has to be pulled out. And that's what's going to happen at the end of the day of the Lord. Hallelujah. And then it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And so there will be no more uh, sacrifices, no more confession of sins, no more um, having to come into a certain place to have fellowship with the Lord. He will be with his people, and we will be with him, and he will be our God, and we shall be his people. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Okay, no more death, because death will be destroyed in the lake of fire. Remember, that was the second death. Hallelujah. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Praise the Lord. All these things that I just read about, all these things that we experience in this world throughout our lives, until the time that we lay down this flesh, all those things shall be passed away. Passed away. What does passed away mean? What does it mean when a person has passed away? It means they're gone. It means they're never coming back. They're not going to be here anymore. They're gone. They're done. You can think about them, but they don't exist anymore, and they will never be there again. That's what passed away means. It's passed away. It's gone. <clears throat> five. Verse 5. Pardon me. <clears throat> and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write unto me, for these words are, and he, excuse me, and he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Jesus is going to say, Behold, I make all things new. This old heaven, the old earth, and all the sin that was with it, and everything that we've known in this life, other than the word of God, it's all going to be gone, passed away. And Jesus is going to make all things new. Hallelujah. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Hallelujah. And he said unto me, It is done. It is done. And I love this. Because the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word that we're reading, the words that are written on these pages, this is the Word. And it was with God from the beginning. It is God. And from the beginning, it was done. The Lamb was slain for the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8 tells us this. 
but the lamb wasn't actually slain in the process of time until about 2,000 years ago. But before the foundation of the world, it was done. And those of us who are in Jesus Christ, we were predestined from before the foundation of the world to be adopted as children by Jesus Christ unto God the Father. Hallelujah. Even as Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, what was manifested in these last times for you and me. 1 Peter 1.20. See? It was done before it started. Just like as I've said to people many times before, if you were going to make a table, before you begin to grab tools and materials, you already know in your mind what the table is going to look like. You already know in your mind what tools you're going to need. You already know in your mind what materials you're going to need. And you have a plan. Now, all, that's up to, all that, that remains is to carry out that plan. And of course, if you were God, then there is no mistakes in carrying out that plan. And there's no getting in the middle of it and finding out that you needed something else. Because the wisdom of God is perfect. And before anything was, the Word was. The Word. Including the words that we're reading right now. God saw the end from the beginning. And there is nothing that has taken him by surprise. Even whatever has taken place in your life today and what shall take place in your life tomorrow, nothing takes God by surprise. It was known to him before the foundation of the world. And so he says here in verse 6, it is done. It is done. And it's not done because he has struggled throughout the ages to try to get it done. It is done because he has ordained it since before the foundation of the world, and it was only a matter of the unfolding of time for it to come to pass. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, saith the Lord, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, Brother Clinton, how do I get thirsty? Well, you know, I don't know if this is right or not, but I was, uh, if, I, if I may give this example, when I was uh, in the world before I knew the Lord Jesus Christ, I was a drunkard. And when I would go to a bar to drink, um, there was always free stuff on the bar to eat. And it was always salty stuff, like pretzels, or chicken wings, or popcorn, or peanuts. And the reason that it was salty stuff was because when you sit there and you eat the free stuff that's salty, then you get thirsty and you drink more. Okay, that's why they put the free stuff out there to eat, because it makes you thirsty, so you buy more alcohol. Okay, so in that same way, Brother Clinton, how do I develop a thirst? Eat bread. Eat bread. And Jesus Christ said, I am the bread that came down from heaven, that you may have eternal life. The bread that cometh down from heaven will give you thirst. The more you eat this bread, the more you will have the thirst that you need to thirst for righteousness and, and to thirst for the, the fountain of the water of life freely. That's a little nugget that I've given to you just now. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of a verse in, in John in the 6th chapter. No, excuse me, in the 16th chapter. Blessed be the name of the Lord. John chapter 16, verse 33, says, These things have I spoken unto you, this is Jesus speaking, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. How did he overcome the world? He did no sin. He did no sin. There was no sin in him. He did no sin. He was the sinless one. Why did he? Why was he raised from the dead? Why is it not possible for death to hold him, as Peter said in the second chapter of Acts? It was not possible for death to hold him because death was created for the wicked. And the reason that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead is because he was innocent when he died. And the fact that we can receive of his spirit today because he is risen from the dead is proof of the fact that he was innocent when he died. He did no sin. There was no sin in him. He overcame he said, I have overcome the world. The world, meaning the world system. Satan is the god of this world. It's written in the book of Ephesians. He's the prince of the power of the air and the god of this world. Uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 10. Satan is the god of this world. And this world is filled with everything that will draw you away from the word of God and cause you to sin, to cause you to lust after things that are not after the word of God. 
the combination of the God of this world and the influence of this world and the fact that you, have, you and I have sin in our members and our flesh lusts after sin, the combination of those two things causes us to be powerless to keep the word of God unless we have the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus reigning in us, which has set us free from the power of sin and death so that we can keep the law which we desire to keep in our mind. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you can read about that in the seventh chapter of Romans if you like. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Well, let's go back to Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Now, there are many of you who say in the churches, well, Jesus Christ overcame the world, and, and he's, the, he's, the, he's the heir, he's the sinless one, and, so, and he died for me, so I can go to heaven no matter what I do. No, 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 no. You're not saved no matter what you do. Jesus Christ died and rose again so that you could be saved from the power of sin. And if you will obey his gospel by believing on his name, repenting from your sins, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory, then you have power over sin so that you're no longer a sinner but a saint and you are able to overcome. And if you abide in that power, if you abide in his word and his word in you, if you abide in the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you keep yourself unspotted from the world, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth you from all sin and we have fellowship one with another. See, but if you just lay down and imagine, well, I'm saved so I can do whatever I want and I'll just, I'm just going to go to heaven, you've been deceived, my friend. You must overcome. Jesus overcame and so must you. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Jesus did not go to the cross to be the only one to suffer and then, and then give us some ridiculous promise that we would never have to suffer anything and all we have to do is just believe and, and, and say a sinner's prayer and we're going to heaven. That doctrine is nowhere in the scripture. It's imaginary. It came from, from hell, basically. It doesn't exist in the scripture anywhere. The Bible says that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Which means that if you believe the gospel of Christ and you do what the apostles commanded, then you will be saved from the power of sin so that you can live right. And if you continue to abide under the power of that gospel and live right, keeping yourself unspotted from the world, then you will inherit the kingdom of God. If you are confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and continuing to believe on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So Jesus said in, in verse 7, Revela I do speak English, Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. He that overcometh. Okay, Who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ. This is written in 1 John. Uh, where is it? In verse chapter 5. I believe. Yes, for whatsoever, chapter 5, verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Praise God. Now, does this mean that if you just simply agree with the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that you have overcome the world? No, of course not. Okay, read the rest of the scripture. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3 and verse uh, 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So when we read in 1 John chapter 5, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That does not mean that the fact that you simply agree that Jesus is the Son of God means that you have overcome the world. What it means is if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you're going to obey his gospel, you're going to obey his word, you're going to keep yourself unspotted from the world, you're going to do what he commanded you to do, and abstain from that which he commanded you not to do, and therefore you will overcome. And in Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, Jesus says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Blessed be the name of the Lord, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. Verse 8, but, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable 
and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Hallelujah. Now let's look at some of these things. The fearful. Okay. The fearful. Are you in an army? If you are a Christian, the answer is yes. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You carry with you the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace, the belt of truth. You have the armor of God on you. Okay, why do you have armor on? Because you're a soldier. Okay, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the things of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Okay, if you're a Christian, you're a soldier. If you're a soldier, you ought not to be fearful. If you're a soldier and you're fearful, you're going to be a disgrace to your commanding officer. You're going to be a danger to those fellow soldiers that are with you, and you are going to lose your life on the battlefield, and you're not going to make it to the finish line. Okay, you cannot be fearful. If you're feel fearful for your life, you will lose it. Jesus said, if you seek to save your life in this world, you will lose it. But if you lose your life in this world for his sake and the gospels, you will save it. Okay, so if you are afraid to die, you don't know Jesus Christ. If somebody stands in front of you with a sword or with a shotgun threatening to cut your head off unless you deny Jesus Christ, if you have fear of that weapon or of that person, then you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you do not believe his word, and you do not believe in the resurrection. Okay? So therefore, it would behoove you to do whatever you can to try to get that person not to kill you, because if he does, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God if you have fear. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know that he is the almighty God, and you know that that sword in your enemy's hand, that, that man, who has a sword in his hand, or that guillotine, or that shotgun, or whatever, he's threatening to take your head off. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you view that as your graduation. You view that as your graduation. One great man of God said when he was about to be thrown to the lions, he said, he didn't say, oh my God, I'm going to die. He said, now do I begin to be a disciple. And he embraced the opportunity to lay down the flesh and achieve the resurrection and obtain the resurrection because he knew that this flesh is vile he knows he knew that the flesh is vile and profiteth nothing but it is the spirit that quickeneth this flesh is a vile suit that we are in and that we are compelled to wear and our spirit groans until the day of the redemption of our bodies which means that when this body is laid down, there's another one that is waiting for us, an incorruptible body. And therefore, we do not have fear. There is no fear in love, because perfect love casteth out fear. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, fear sometimes is a good thing. We're commanded to fear God. Okay, that's in the center of the whole Bible. It's the primary central commandment of the whole of the scripture. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. See, and sometimes fear is good. If you're walking out in the woods and you hear a bear growling, fear causes you to go the other way. That's a good thing. Okay, if you're getting ready to cross the freeway and you hear a truck coming, fear causes you to wait until the truck passes by. That's a good thing. Okay, sometimes fear is a good thing. Fearing that which is dangerous to you is a good thing. But fearing your enemy, Satan, and anything that he could do to you to try to get you to to persuade you to deny your Savior is a wrong thing and a, and a thing that is unacceptable before God. And if you have, if you profess to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and you have fear of the enemy, in so much that the enemy, your enemy, can cause you to deny your God or to disobey your God, that is unacceptable before God. And that's why the Scripture says, "The fearful shall inherit the lake which burns with fire and brimstone." And what else? And the unbelieving. And the unbelieving. Well, this of course includes all those people that don't profess to be Christians at all and don't, you know, they say that there is no God and all that foolishness. But it also includes those in the church of Jesus Christ who do not believe his word. Okay, the people of Israel were the chosen people of God, remember? Let's go, hold your place in Revelation 21 and let's go to the Psalms chapter 95. Hallelujah. And let's read from verse 8. Well, from the, from the middle of verse 7, it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, and the writer of Hebrews quoted this, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. What is provocation? 
when you provoke someone to anger, when you poke someone and slap someone and, and speak evil of someone and do whatever it takes to try to provoke someone, to try to get them to smack you down, to try to get them angry, to try to get them to attack you, to try to get them to do something evil to you. That's what it means to provoke. Provocation is what the, the people of Israel offered unto God in the wilderness. Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And the writer of Hebrews quoted this passage of scripture, and he said that they did not enter into God's rest because of their unbelief. But wait a minute, they were the people of God. They were the chosen people of God. They were the apple of his eye. They saw the miracles that he did. They saw the Red Sea open up. They saw Pharaoh and all of his uh, all of his, his hosts washed away in the sea. They saw the plagues of God come upon the people of Egypt. And they would not believe because God told them, I want you to go over there into that land and take it. And they sent spies over there into the land. And, they, and the spies came back and 10 of them out of the 12 said, oh no, we can't take it. The people are too big. And the people refused to believe God's word and they did not enter into his kingdom. And today in the churches, the churches are filled with people who do not believe God's word. They do not believe God's word. They rebel against God's word. They don't believe his promises. They don't believe his commandments. Jesus sent his apostles into the world saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And the apostles gave those teachings to the churches in those days, and they wrote them down in, in, in epistles that we have in the English language to read today. And people in the churches read those epistles of the instructions of the apostles, commanding the people in the churches to do as Jesus Christ had commanded, and the people in the churches today will not obey. They will not obey. The women will not cover their heads with veils. The women will not grow their hair out as it's supposed to be. They cut their hair like men. The women wear clothes that pertain to men. The women stand in the, in the pulpits and pretend to be pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets and evangelists. And the men in the churches fail to obey the word of God. And they are whoremongers and they are unholy and they are wicked and they are covetous and they are idolaters and all the things that we're about to talk about in the next few minutes here. The people in the churches today will not obey the word of God. They will not obey the word of God. They turn to witchcraft and sorcery and astronomy and astrology and false religions and doctrines of devils and, and the, the, the nonsense of theology rather than believing the word of God. And the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the word of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you read God's word and you don't believe it, you are condemned. That's it. It's just that simple. If you allow the, 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 the serpents, theologians, to come to you and tell you that the Word of God in this Holy Bible, authorized King James Version, if you speak English, this is the Word of God. If you allow the serpents, theologians, to come to you and tell you that the Word that is written in this Bible is not really the way it's supposed to be, and that in their opinion, according to the original manuscripts, it really should be translated another way, you have been deceived, and you do not believe God's Word, and you are destined for the fire. It's just that simple. The unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. I don't care how eloquent the theologian may be when he comes to me because I am born of this word. And when he comes to me and tells me that this word really doesn't mean what it says and that in his opinion, according to his uh, great knowledge, it should really say something else. I reject that because the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And so if you come to me, and I don't care how eloquent your explanation is, and you try to tell me that one word of this scripture was translated incorrectly, and you try to change it with another word that gives a different meaning to the sentence, I reject that because I am a child of God. And if you're a child of God, you will reject that too. And if you don't reject it, you will be turned over unto the darkness, and you will be destroyed in the fire. Because the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Now let's look at the next word, abominable. The abominable. What does that mean, abominable? Well, abomination is something that is hated. It's something that is despised. 
And the word abominable or abomination is in the Bible lots of times, and I want to share a few of them with you. I have it on, on my screen here in front of me. Um, I'm just going to look at a few examples so that we can get an idea of what the word abomination means. But the word abomination is in the Bible, I don't know, a couple hundred times. I don't even know. Let's, In fact, let's check it out. Let's see how many times the word abomination is in the scripture. Abomination. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 142 times. Okay, 142 times. Now, I want to go over some things with you. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 24. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Okay. Remember the Lord said to his people, the children of Israel, when you go into that land, I want you to destroy them utterly. I want you to destroy their altars. I, I don't want you to find out how they worship their gods. I want you to destroy them utterly. Men, women, little children, all their animals, all their gods, don't desire the silver or the gold that is on them. Just destroy them. I am able to give you whatever you need. I am telling you to destroy these people and these things. And God told his people that because he didn't want them to do after their abominations. Okay, let me read that verse again. 1 Kings 14, 24. And there were also sodomites in the land. What are sodomites, boys and girls? They are men who have sexual lust for other men. Okay, they are not gay. They are sodomites. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. 2 Kings 16.3 But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. This is another of the abominable customs of the people that lived in that land before Israel. They would burn their children in the fire, sacrificing them to Molech and other deities that were no gods at all. That's another abomination. Okay, what else is abomination? Now, 2 Chronicles 34, 33. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of all the countries that pertain to the children of Israel, and made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. So Josiah was that righteous king who the Lord said, Many years before his birth, he would come, and the Lord even called him by name, and that he would cleanse Israel. And he did, and he took away all the abominations, which was the altars, and the, and the houses of the sodomites, and the soothsayers, and the witches. Josiah took them all out of the land. Let's go to Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 22. For the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. Okay. For those of us who are kind of new to the scripture, let's not confuse the word froward with the word forward. Okay. To be forward is to be kind of bold in a way. You know, you might walk up to a stranger who has um, something on his shirt and you might say, pardon me for being so forward because I don't know you, but you have something on your shirt. Okay. That's forward. Froward is different. Froward means to act foolishly. Okay, like the husband of Abigail, his name was Nabal because he was a fool. And he acted frowardly because David sent his messengers and Nabal rejected them and he was rude to them. And that's what frowardness is. Froward is, is frowardness is when a person acts in a foolish way, a brutish way. He's rude, he's insulting, he doesn't think before he speaks. Um, that's what frowardness is. And the Bible says, for the froward is abomination to the Lord. Why is this? Because the, because the Lord wants the Lord has a kingdom and his kingdom is holy. And in a holy kingdom there is no room for fools and idiots and brutes who don't know how to speak or conduct themselves properly in a royal palace. Okay? If you have even in your own house, you don't want somebody in your house who is dirty, clumsy, stupid, um, foul mouthed. You don't want somebody in your house that's going to defile your house. Your house is where you have peace. Okay, you don't want somebody in your house that's going to be drunk and tripping over things and breaking stuff. And maybe there'll be a danger to your children or they'll be speaking things in front of your children that you don't want your children to hear. That's frowardness. And even, like, even as you don't want a person like that in your house to defile your house, neither does the Lord want a person like that in his house to defile his house. His house is holy and he has prepared it for them that love him to be a glory to him and to his saints. For the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so frowardness has no place in his kingdom. And therefore the froward 
is abomination to the Lord. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1. A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Okay, what is a false balance? Well, in the days when people used to create or, or conduct commerce by using actual money, which is silver and gold or copper or whatever it was, you know, metal that was worth money, uh, they would measure that on a scale. You know, a, a certain item, say, say a watermelon, would be, you know, an ounce of silver, so to speak. Just for example, I don't know if that's a fair price, but if it were an ounce of silver, so you would take out an ounce of silver and you would put it on the scale and the man would have a weight that weighs one ounce and he would put it on the other side of the scale to make sure that your silver weighs one ounce. Okay. Well, what if the man secretly had a weight that only weighed three quarters of an ounce and he put the three quarters of an ounce on the scale and all of a sudden yours was not weighing out right. I didn't say that right because yours would be too heavy then. It, okay. Say that he had a Pardon me. <laughs> Say that he had a weight that weighed one and a half ounces, but he told you it weighed one ounce, and he put it on the scale, and your silver didn't weigh as much as his weight. So he would say, well, you still owe me another half ounce. See, he would be tricking you. He'd be lying to you. He'd be stealing from you because he used a false weight, okay, a false balance. And a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. See, it is his delight that we do things honestly, provide all things honest before all men, because that glorifies him. Just like when you send, if you have children, when you send your children into the world, if, if, if a report comes back that, you know, your child lied to my child or stole from my child or beat up my child or whatever, that reflects on you, and that's an embarrassment. But if a report comes back saying, wow, your child is awesome and just did a wonderful thing, or your child is so smart, or your child is so well-behaved, that's a glory to you. See, that's a wonderful thing. That's why you teach your child how to act and how to behave himself so that he can conduct himself properly in the world and also so that you can be a proud parent because of, excuse me, because of how your child behaves. Praise the Lord. So a false balance is abomination to the Lord. Um, Proverbs 11, verse 20, again, they that are of a froward heart are abomination unto the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. So we can see that frowardness and uprightness are in contraposition to each other. They are opposite. Okay? They that are of a froward heart are abomination to the Lord. What else is abomination to the Lord? Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord. What else is an abomination to the Lord? Proverbs chapter <clears throat> 15, pardon me. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. And a sacrifice and a prayer are the same thing. Okay, Because remember in, in, in the Psalms it's written, let, let, let the lifting up of my hands be as the evening sacrifice unto thee. A prayer to the Lord is the same thing as a burnt sacrifice. In the same way that, a, that, a, that an animal was burnt on the altar and the smoke would rise up and it would be a sweet savor unto the Lord if the people of Israel had offered it with the right um, intents in their heart according to the law, then it would be a sweet savor unto the Lord. And so it is when we dwell in righteousness according to his gospel and the power of his gospel, and we make prayers unto him. The prayer of the upright is his delight, but the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. You see, if you're not in Jesus Christ, if you're not living in accordance with his word, I don't care if you go to church or not, if you're not living in obedience to Jesus Christ, and you get on your knees and pretend somehow that you are and offer your praise and sacrifices and your prayers and, your, and you're lifting up of your hands and you're singing and all your worship unto him, it is filth unto him. It is abomination unto him. He wants nothing to do with it. He hates it. And that's why he said unto Israel in the first chapter of Isaiah concerning their sacrifices, the very same thing. In Isaiah, in the first chapter, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'm going to begin in verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Oh, my goodness. He speaks to the people of Israel, and he calls them Sodom. Oh, my. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he-goats. When ye come to appear before me... Who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Even the solemn meeting, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. 
I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And then God says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Praise the Lord. So the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. I don't care how good of an orator you are, and I don't care how good you can cry when you pray to the Lord, and I don't care how good you can sing, I should say how well you could sing. I don't care what kind of a performance you put on, whether it be in the public, in church, or in your prayer closet at home. If you are not walking in obedience to the Lord, your prayer is an abomination to Him. The Lord is far from the wicked. But he heareth the prayer of the righteous. That's, I believe, in Proverbs 29. But Proverbs 15, 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. The thoughts of the wicked. Now, does this mean, I need to explain this, does this mean, Brother Clinton, that if I'm in prayer or if I'm do, just doing anything and I have an unclean thought in my head, that I'm an abomination? No, that's not what it means. Because we live in a world full of uncleanness, and, and this body is full, its members are full of wickedness. And it is possible for us, even in the midst of prayer, to have an unclean thought. Just like a pornographic movie, it'll just come into your head. Okay? It is possible to have a thought like that. Now, when that thought comes, you have a choice. You can cast down that thought. You can say, I cast down that thought in the name of Jesus Christ, for it is written. And replace it with the Word of God, whatever that thought might be. You know, if it's a, if it's a, a thought about fornication, then, then, then say it is written, um, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body, and that thought will leave. Okay? Or if it's a thought about doing violence to someone, okay, I cast down that thought in the name of Jesus Christ, for it is written, recompense to no man, evil for evil. Get thee behind me, Satan. I cast that thought down in Jesus' name, and that thought will leave. But if you meditate on it, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, fornications, adulteries, an evil eye, blasphemy, and so on and so forth. So if you just leave that thought there and meditate on it until it comes to the point of fruition, then it is wickedness. And that's what this is talking about, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. It doesn't, this is not referring to a passing thought that comes into your mind and you cast down and walk away from it. It's talking about machinations, imaginations. It's talking about you sitting there imagining these things and meditating on them and then mulling them over in your mind. Okay, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Praise the Lord. What else is abomination to the Lord? Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 16, 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished pride. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Period. Hallelujah. And again, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 10, diverse weights and diverse measures. Both of them are like abomination to the Lord. Hallelujah. Now let's look at Isaiah chapter 66, verse 17. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination in the mouse, shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. Okay. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is talking about pagan religions, pagan customs, pagan sacrifices. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 7, verse 30. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. Well, Brother Clinton, I've never done that, haven't you? Okay, and I'm not accusing you, whoever you are on the other side of this camera. Okay, but I'm saying, okay, you profess to be a Christian. Do you have a crucifix in your house? Do you have a picture of an imaginary Jesus in your house, that Catholic art that's supposedly Jesus Christ, which has nothing to do with Jesus Christ? Do you have a stack of pornography under your bed? Do you have books in your house on witchcraft, astrology, pharmacology? Okay, these are just a few examples. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, 
to pollute it. When you go to your thing called a church, is there a crucifix statue in your church house? Is there? Is there, a, if you're a Catholic, is there a, a glass coffin with a, with a bloody statue of a dying man in it that you pretend is Jesus Christ? Is there a man in your church house with a costume who calls himself by a title like Reverend this or Bishop that? Those are abominations. See, they have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's just a few examples of what abominations are to the Lord, what things are abominable to the Lord. And in Revelation 21, verse 7, it says, excuse me, in verse 8, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, these shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Okay? So if you want to make sure that you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, you need to know what is abominable to the Lord, and you need to keep yourself from that. Hallelujah. Let's look at what else it says. And murderers. Murderers. Well, what is a murderer? Well, obviously a murderer is someone who kills another person. But there's more to it than that. Because the Bible says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Jesus said, if you hate your brother without a cause, and you say unto him, Raka, you will be in danger of the judgment. Okay? So murderers, a murderer is someone who hates his brother. Now, who is my brother? Just like a man said to the Lord, who is my neighbor? Someone said, who is my brother? And Jesus said, my mother and my brethren are these that hear the word of God and do it. Okay? So your brother is someone who is in covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ with you. Not that that gives you an excuse to be hateful towards people that are outside the covenant, because the scripture says, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Okay? Honor all men. Peter said this. Love the brotherhood. Okay? You love the brotherhood in a different way than you have love for all men, but still you honor all men. Okay? We are not to walk in hatred. We are to walk in love. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. John said this. Okay? Let's move on. Whoremongers. Whoremongers. Now, I don't usually get into Greek very much, but this will kind of help you out. It doesn't change the meaning of the word at all. It just kind of gives you a little better understanding of, of the word whoremonger, because most people don't use the word, the English word whoremonger. The word whoremonger is translated from the Greek word pornos. A porno is someone who is a whoremonger. Okay? A porno is someone who is a whoremonger. A, a whoremonger is someone who has uncontrollable sexual urges and just desires to be with any anyone that he can to always fulfill his lust. Lascivious. Okay? And Paul said to Timothy, he said, uh, and I don't remember exactly where it was right now, but he said, of such are these that creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with diverse sins, or laden with sins and diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Four mothers. These will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will inherit the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. And sorcerers. Sorcerers. Well, what is a sorcerer? A sorcerer is a practicer of magic. Okay? A practicer of magic. Witchcraft. What is included in witchcraft that a lot of people don't know about? Okay? There is a term that we have in, in our English language, which is not an English word, that we use all the time. And that, that word is pharmacy. Pharmacy is a Greek word that was injected into the English language to distract people's attention away from the fact that the man that we call a pharmacist is a witch doctor. Okay? I'm not being um, overdramatic. I'm not uh, exaggerating. A pharmacist is a witch doctor. These are two words that mean the same thing. The, the thing is that pharmacist, that word pharmacist, has been injected into our language by the god of this world, Satan, in order to distract people away from the fact that a pharmacist is a witch doctor. Pharmacology is witchcraft. How can I say that? Because the word pharmakia is translated as witchcraft in the book of Galatians in the fifth chapter. I believe it's the 20th verse uh, when Paul was talking about the, the works of the flesh. And he listed 17 things which are the works of the flesh. And one of those is witchcraft. And the English word witchcraft was translated from the Greek word pharmakia. Pharmakia is pharmacology, and it is witchcraft. The use of chemicals 
and potions in order to cure sicknesses is witchcraft. And if you use that to cure sicknesses, you are a sorcerer. If you mix those things to sell them to other people, you are a sorcerer. If you're a doctor who prescribes those things to other people, you are a sorcerer. And if you are a sorcerer, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's just that simple. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sorcerers. I'm going to cut this video short right now. And the reason is because it's beginning to rain and I have something I need to do outside that I'm going to continue in just a few short minutes. Blessed be the name of the Lord.